Welcome to our show, our show. I'm Jacob Caudill, the undergraduate scholar for the Gordy Institute. With me today is Dr. Russ McCullough, the founder of the Gordy Institute and Wayne Angel Chair of Economics, and Dr. Peter Jacobson, the professor of economics and education and research. All right, well, we have a special show today. We've got uh, three professors. We are sitting live in front of an audience for uh, only the second time, actually, the second time we did that, or the other time we did that was here as well. And um, so we've got a whole bunch of undergraduate students that are thinking about uh, humanomics and uh, human flourishing and uh, civil society and federalism, a lot of exciting things that we're talking about. And so the focus of the uh, podcast today is going to be on civil society. And so our guests here are Dr. Tony Gill from the University of Washington and Dr. Vlad Tarko from the University of Arizona. And finally, Dr. Michael Thomas, he's the hometown boy here uh, from Creighton University. So let's all give him a round of applause. All right, so Tony, we're going to start with you. What, uh, what do you got to say about civil society? How can you help frame for the listeners? The listeners here uh, didn't have the opportunity to hear you speak last night. So kind of frame it up a little bit of what is civil society? So in our discussion last night, uh, I mentioned to everybody that I was trained as a political economist, and that usually means that one takes a look at market processes and sees that there might be shortcomings in markets, that there are market failures. A good political economist will immediately run to the government to solve a lot of these market failures or market problems. What I talked about last night was the role of civil society, that there is a a, a zone, an organizational zone between atomistic individuals within the marketplace and then the government which is there to design and provide public goods and to mitigate uh, pollution and externalities and things like that. And civil society is uh, the you and I in organizations that we form of our own volition that help to govern our society. Some of these might be very formal organizations, such like churches or uh, interest groups like the Sierra Club or the YMCA, but they also can be very informal groups that rely upon social norms, values, and rituals, uh, or culture as we call it, to help govern our everyday lives. And uh, my point that I was making last night was that as political economist scholars, we oftentimes forget about the importance of how everyday people in their everyday lives go around creating structures that allow them to govern their own behavior. In fact, I would just ask the audience here, think about how much of your life is governed by the formal laws of government and how well you know those as compared to all those informal norms and behavioral patterns that you engage in every day with interactions with every other individual, be it how you stand in an elevator, how you greet individuals, or just how you interact with your neighbors and homeowners associations. That is civil society. And for me, it's a beautiful space where we learn to govern ourselves. So would, uh, when you talked last night, I thought about the voluntary nature of market transactions, and, and you describe that as we can start with kind of an extreme case of a, of a greedy, selfish, but self-interested person, and then, uh, but through voluntary action can find win-win situations by trading with others and exchanging and having relationships. And then at the other end, we've got government who operates through coercion, through force. Um, and then in the middle is this wonderful little twinkle of people building bigger associations that they want to be a part of. It's still on the voluntary realm. Is that, a, is that a fair characterization of things, thinking voluntary versus coercion is one of the main points? Yeah, it's, it's voluntary uh, associations of individuals exchanging their time and energies with one another to form ways to govern themselves. Now, one should you know, uh, understand that for in many cases, this works very well in helping people get along, but there are instances where this kind of civic culture can lead to the bad things. But the point is, is that there is something, and there is an alternative between markets and governments, and that's you and I getting together in our daily lives and just figuring it out ourselves. Michael, how important do you think this stuff is with the civil society, the squishy stuff in the middle? Well, I think it's where all the action is. So what we, what we recognize is humans are flawed, right? We make errors all the time. So the, the question is not whether or not we can find perfectible people, because that just doesn't exist. 
The question is, what are the institutions that allow us to discover the errors and correct for them? So what I want out of civil society is smaller groups that allow me the opportunity to choose, to find out what's a good fit, to when I find a good foot, fit, keep it, when I am not a good fit, to change to another group. So um, those of you in the audience, we have a bunch of undergrads, some of you might have changed universities from one university to the other. You were, or you may have changed majors, right? Finding those opportunities to discover something, a fit for yourself and then to change. We talked about this morning school choice a little bit, right? Finding communities where you might have something in common on religion or something in common for a sports team. Uh, a, a particular instrument that you play, you go to a magnet school in a, in a particularly large school district. We try to find ways that we can work, uh, find fit for the individual so that those people can flourish and they can walk away from things that are not a good fit. So I had a question for the group then. Um, one of the things that I, I think Dr. Beal, you alluded to was that uh, we, we sort of have to educate about this sort of thing because it's not necessarily the first response of people when they see a problem. In other words, it seems like a common response when we have a problem in society that people say, well, we should pass a law, and this is something that you discussed last night. Do you have any insight or any thought as to why is it the case that people don't think, well, we should develop a new norm or we need to create a new club in order to solve this? Why is the first instinct a move towards politics rather than a move towards civil society? Any of you? Vlad, would you like to take that? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think social norms are kind of like the way a fish doesn't notice the water, the same way we don't notice the social norms that surround us. So if you're thinking of markets and politics, the way in which they work is actually heavily dependent on the social norms involved. So for example, in the theory of markets, you would have something like, well, they depend on property rights, they depend on contracts, but those um, cannot be fully enforced. The contracts can only specify a limited number of uh, uh, situations. So in fact, the way in which, uh, for example, uh, the relation between an employee and an employer works is heavily dependent on various norms, not just on the contract. Uh, and in the same way with politics, um, say the way in which uh, American politics works is not just uh, determined by the American Constitution. There are a lot of norms about how politicians should behave uh, that are perhaps even more important than the formal uh, rules in place. Um, so these are so pervasive that we don't really consider them precisely because we're so used to encountering them all the time. Um, so when you're asking, okay, we have a problem, how about we solve it by changing the social norms, right? It, to some extent, social norms perform the same purpose as the same function as the laws. However, we don't really have a specific, a specific mechanism to change social norms. Uh, we don't even have a way to, um, to determine which social norms are good or bad, right? It's just there's a very complicated uh, society in which we are, uh, and we have these norms that we're used to. Uh, we don't even pay much attention. Are these rules that we're following good or bad? And suppose you're starting to um, challenge one of them. Do you even know how you would go about changing the social norm? Right, you would have to somehow to form some sort of uh, snowball effect to get many other people to follow you and so on. And can you even determine what would be a good change in the social norms? So it seems like there are much fewer specific levers or you know, buttons to push to change the social norms. Um, however, there was another thing um, mentioned yesterday by Tony. Uh, where so the social uh, the civil society is not just social norms it's also these civil organizations which are more like uh, specific things that can do things so um, yeah so maybe you want to talk more about the dangers I, I want to add one more thing to just to poke you uh, so there's also another element 
here that you know firms especially big firms engaging this corporate social responsibility so is that civil society uh, is that something yeah, I know Tony doesn't like it so that's why I mentioned it. <laughs> um, I, I want to go back to something that you said just a minute ago but it, you know why do we rely on government more than norms uh, as Vlad pointed out it, laws are passed norms evolve and there's a, a certain degree of patience that you need to do with organic social change that we often lack if we see a problem we want it fixed right away and to say that well let's just let society work this out over time is often very unsatisfying especially when we think we might have uh, some leaders in front of us that could pass off these things as far as social responsibility of corporations go, I just want to go on the record that I like social responsibility <laughs> and I like corporations. But oftentimes, if we try to change norms too fast and becomes very faddish and you know, try to get individuals to behave according to the latest and greatest thing that happens to be on social media, it can divert people in, in a lot of different directions away from their core competencies. And that might be one of the things that, that troubles me about social responsibility or corporate responsibility is that we're telling all these corporations just so that we can like them better, that they have to chase what is popular right now rather than focusing on what they, they actually do. And oftentimes it can come across as very ungenuine. I think civil society works best when it, it evolves organically slowly and has a very genuine component to it that people have internalized and believe and, uh, you know, pursue the norms that they actually uh, subscribe to. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about this. Like, when you say there ought to be a law, you're skipping to something that's pretty extreme. So uh, you can frame this in terms of the principal agent problem, right? I'm a principal, I have certain things that I wanna do. I can sit in my office by myself and decide that this thing ought to happen. And if I go directly to an expert or directly to a politician to, to solve that, that is an agent. But there's another, use of the word agency, which is to go out and talk to somebody, figure out why they believe or whether they actually disagree at all, I might actually agree completely with my peers and colleagues. If that first step is to go out and actually talk to people and have conversations and build community, that's a better concept of agency in my opinion than just merely sending that agency as far or remotely to someone else and having them act on your behalf without that interaction, without that reciprocity, without those sorts of communal I have a question to throw out to the panel, uh, and then we'll probably be close to heading into our break already. From time just flies. How critical is the culture and the kind of the, the foundation um, for having these uh, civil society be meaningful and, and be there for meaningful changes? I think about the United States, and I think we started with freedom, individual freedom. Some of that's been eroded away, but it's allowed uh, civil society to develop a little differently than, let's say, Russia. The fall of the wall, 1991, here we are 20 years later, and now look at what's going on in Russia, or maybe you can look to China. Um, you know, some differences there on, on where a country starts and whether or not it's going to be possible to have the culture um, embrace this as a possible meaningful change for society. Um, yeah, so I think um, something like capitalism uh, is actually compatible with pretty much any culture, but it operates very differently. So a classic comparison here is between American and European version of capitalism and the Japanese version of capitalism. So the European and uh, American uh, kind of culture is more contentious. So when there's a law, then the first reaction is, we're gonna contest the law, we're gonna go to court. Uh, in Japan is not like that. So the result of that is that in Europe and United States you have to have minute detailed laws for everything because it's gonna get contested. By contrast in Japan you have more things that look kinda like rule of law, general rules, but they're not really because there's uh, a lot of um, uh, authority to the people who apply the rules and that authority is not challenged. So that would be an example where two different cultures kind of operate under a system, uh, an economic system that has similar outcomes, but the way in which the outcome is achieved is different. 
So in a sense, the system has to adapt to the various uh, cultures. Uh, I think what's important is that there, there can be many different cultural systems and norms that work in a variety of different places. The important thing is that these norms have to be allowed to evolve and change according to the different circumstances and how those circumstances change over time. So one of the things that I emphasized in my previous talk was the importance of freedom or liberty for people to you know, go about their daily lives and figure out things for themselves, but also tolerance. Uh, tolerance is immensely important to understand that things are going to change, there are going to be people who have norms and values that are different than you, and that these might actually get you to rethink some of yours change your mind, change your behaviors in certain ways. And so for me at least, the, the core principles of all successful societies rely upon freedom and tolerance. The, the word I would use that's similar to tolerance is forbearance or the, the waiting to intervene, the willingness, the default not to intervene to see what happens and being able to allow other people to play out their own discovery process probably is better for everybody. Ah, great. All right, well, this looks like a good spot for a break, and when we come back, we will field questions from the audience here. We'll be back. Okay, we're back. Well, we're going to turn it back over to the audience now, and uh, I see Lauren has her hand up, and she was in my group, so I know something good's going to come out of her mouth. Lauren. Okay, so going back to what Dr. Gill said in both the presentation last night and the podcast today, you said that the informal groups will help change social norms. And um, Dr. Thomas also touched on this, and we all know this, that humans are inherently flawed and so is our judgment. So a bigger question I want to ask is, when do you draw the line between letting people do whatever they want in terms of social change and social norms and making government policy? And so, and Dr. Gill also touched on the topic of liberty. And so a bigger question I wanted to ask was how much should you trust the common person to contribute to collective action and social change? Uh, I will echo Professor Thomas here and that word forbearance is a wonderful word to use in this context. How much do I trust the average person? I actually put a lot of trust in my fellow citizens um, and I know that that might be in short supply nowadays in a very contentious world that seems contentious, but uh, I have faith in my human, I think uh, my fellow humans, and I think that it's a good place to start. And then allow them to see what happens, allow them to see what the possibilities are before we move toward government intervention, which tends to be very stark, very blunt, and tends to be locked in. Once a, po once a law is made, it's oftentimes very difficult to change that law. So what, what Professor Thomas said here before, forbearance is a wonderful uh, policy to always have in our, our hip pocket. I'd, I'd like to add on to that that um, we don't allow the, the benefits, but more importantly, the cost of actions to be done. I think Milton Friedman once said, in a profit and loss system, the losses are way more important than the profits. And so we don't always let the, that uh, play out uh, for us to change behavior. And so, yeah, I think this whole topic on forbearance and as well as individual actions, um, we're just too quick to turn towards the government. I think part of that question was, where is the line? Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't and, hear that answer. And I, I'm going to answer that by giving you the answer to why I can't answer that, uh, which at least is a direct uh, weasel way out of this, uh, which is that, uh, you know, I, I half like the phrase that is really popular right now, you know, think global, act local. I'm a big fan of uh, think local, act local. That, that's sort of my approach. And so I think that it's, it's hard to draw a line because I actually think local situations uh, kind of determine where the line is. And so I'm very uncomfortable drawing lines when it comes to global situations, things I'm less and less familiar with, I'm less and less embedded in. But as I get closer and closer to a problem, this happens with my kids. Uh, I watch them as they uh, fight with each other and I can see a conflict start way before it happens, but sometimes I let it play out. And sometimes I don't, like if they're standing on top of the couch when it's starting. Uh, so I, I, I think that the only way that we can draw the line is with the, the local information. Yeah. 
I'm Emily. Um, earlier on in the podcast, you're talking about how we get together, we're a different group of people, and we talk about problems, come up with solutions. Later on, those problems and solutions can move on and make it into policy. But I feel like that's a very privileged stance because there's a lot of minorities that don't have the ability to actually push whatever discussions, if they're even able to have those discussions, into making it into policy. So how do you account for those that actually need the movement? Because while, while we can find little problems within our society or within the group of people that's standing, the sitting on that table, your issues are not the same issues of those that might actually really need your help. So how do you account for those while using your privilege, because all of you have that? So, you know, I think the real issue that I think we're talking about is whether or not one size fits all solutions can work for everyone. So the goal is remarkably well articulated, which is that everybody should be treated the same way before the law. And I think that that's an incredibly important part of the Enlightenment tradition, and it goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, moving out of feudal times and all that kind of stuff. But in actual practice, in order to discover differences in what different people need, you have to have groups that are able to articulate those things and find commonalities and work together and have different approaches. And so I don't think you would remove that. I think you would want that sort of competition between groups. The question is, what are the systematic, right, so it's comparative institutional analysis, in what systems are there opportunities for minority viewpoints to flourish and thrive for longer periods of time? Um, and if the only solution is to alternate or cycle through different minorities taking control over the one size fits all, I think that would be a devastating solution for, for society. I'd like to add on to that. Um, I think what what is the be best mechanism is somewhat at play here, whether we turn to the government for a law change or whether we allow freedom and civil society to evolve and come up with their, its own solution. I think if you look carefully at the history of the United States and maybe even further back, but especially the United States since the freedom premise was there, uh, how did women get rights? It was through civil society of women's liberation organizations. Um, black organizations, Martin Luther King. Uh, yes, there was problems, but they had the freedom to be able to organize in some way, shape, or form. Uh, gay rights movements, right? Uh, all of that is through civil society finding ways or pushing for solutions to try to persuade uh, law changes, but I think more importantly to persuade the general public that there's a wrong here that we need to make right and ultimately leading to a law change. But that's what's driving it, I think, in our system. And if we go the other route, I think it's too prone for error. If it's, uh, we, we rely on Washington, D.C. or a, an elect group of elites uh, to do that, I, I don't think we get a better outcome than allowing it to grow organically in civil society. <coughs> Okay, and when you guys have a question, we can go to the next question, but go ahead and say your name and uh, the university you're from. All right, so I'll start. Um, my name is Luke Claus. I go to Creighton uh, here in Omaha. And so my question kind of goes off of what you are just speaking to. Um, so we've been talking a lot about civil society and how it's this more or less perfect transition from uh, econ economics and people and how they interact with the government. So it's this good, cushy feeling right in the middle. Um, but it's also, there's a dichotomy of the voluntary versus involuntary because government relies on coercion. So we haven't really mentioned how civil society interacts with government, at least I haven't touched on it specifically, because I feel like we've been seeing a lot of like, you know, puts the human and humanomics. That's the combination of economics and civil society. And then we were speaking about all these different ways that people gain rights. So how do we see informal groups, formal groups interacting with the government, especially if the perspectives of the formal groups directly contrast with the government, how, how those play out because if the people are wanting a change and the government's against it, who wins in this? Because in the case of the government, they have coercion, they're going to be oppressing and keeping down the voluntary uh, hopes and aspirations of the people. That That's an interesting question and a, a challenging one. Civil society 
is very good at identifying problems at the ground ground level, at the grassroots, and people come together and, and recognize there are these things. It allows them to lobby government to point out policies that are not adequate and, and possibly to engage uh, other individuals to say, hey, we need some changes in these things. The other thing that civil society can do is run parallel to government. And there's this great book by Robert Ellickson called Order Without Law. And in this book, he talks about Shasta County ranchers who basically have a way of managing property rights irrespective of what the laws in California were. And the, one of the funniest parts of the book, and it's a, it's a delightful read because it's filled with you know, conflict which draws you in, but these folksy stories of, of farmers in, in Northern California. One of the, the funniest things was that when they were trying to mitigate some of the problems that arose with new ranchers moving into the area, the, the law enforcement officers didn't even know the laws that they were supposed to enforce. And this is where law without, or excuse me, order without law is the name of the book, order without law. Um, and what they found, or what Ellickson found was that everybody just had this kind of civil code amongst themselves is that this is how we're going to organize things. And the way they solved a lot of the problems with them, some of the cattle you know, crossing into some of the other uh, property was just to kind of talk it out and to work, work through it. Um, and so I recommend a lot of folks do that. Robert Ellickson's book, Order Without Law. I want to build on something that Tony said. Uh, so I think ideally uh, civil society is very good uh, primarily of identifying various problems that are um, not as visible, especially, for example, to the elites. Uh, but there is a, a kind of problem that can occur, uh, and I have encountered this uh, when I was in Europe and I was working in a think tank there. Uh, so um, a major problem with uh, non-governmental organizations in Europe is that they're getting most of their funding from governments and from the European Union. So how that system works is that the European Union would figure out, okay, these are the problems that need solving, and then they would basically have a call, and then the different NGOs would apply. So then instead of the civil society discovering what the problems are, now civil society is becoming employed into solving what the you know European Union bureaucrats say the problems are, so that's kind of a danger. Uh, so so it depends a lot on how the civil society organizations are funded. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that funding shift here in the United States, uh, right? So the government is more involved in whether it's uh, fun helping fund students' education at the great university in Ottawa, Kansas. Uh, they have some strings to pull and can put that extra pressure and the same is true at some of these other organizations. Yeah, and it may be just as simple as diverting resources, you know, to different priorities. Yeah. All right, next question. Uh, my name is Lawson Medlin from Ottawa University and my question is, what steps can we take to deter uh, immediate government intervention on developing social norms? In other words, like, just letting things play out and then, as you guys were saying. I have a very glib answer. If you just ignore the government, it'll go away. <laughs> um, that probably won't work, though. Um, but I, I, I think it takes a courage on the part of citizens to say no to government. And it's not an easy step to do. Um, and, and to just reach out you know, to your neighbor broadly defined to say um, I, I don't think we need the government to interact in our lives in this area let's assert our autonomy and how do you do that I you know just a simple-minded academic I would just say educate more people to that effect I mean if you're gonna have a robust uh, civil society then what you're going to have to do is represent that in your own life so if you know people that are in need of charity if you know people who, uh, who are working hard and need to be tipped in order to make it through their um, through their circumstances if you um, if there's any opportunity to step up and be the thing that people want to happen that they're saying there ought to be a law 
to happen, then you have to do that. And if you're not willing to do that, then slowly but surely you're voting for more abstract and more uniform and more one-size-fits-all policies to be pushed out because you're abandoning that responsibility. Um, yeah, so the way in which norms form is, um, is out of the repeated interactions. Um, so I think uh, many people underestimate just how fast norms can form. So I'll give you just one example. Uh, so after the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, uh, there, was, there were all these small shops that popped around immediately, basically. So in the, at the very beginning, uh, basically all these shops will try to not give you the proper change. Okay, so that, that norm of honesty formed very quickly because people got pissed. You know, it's like, you didn't give me the proper change, I'm not coming to you again. Uh, so it was a norm of honesty that formed very quickly. Um, so to, to give you an, an example of just how strong this norm is, like just, so I was in, uh, in Budapest, it was like mid 90s. Uh, so, and I got confused about their currency and I paid for like something on the street, like I gave them like 10 times more money. And the guy just left his shop and came running down the street for me to give me the, you know, the proper change, right? So, and, and that would not have happened just a few years earlier. Um, so how do, how do these norms form, right? It's just these kind of repeated interactions. And once the norms form, they operate even with, you know, like a stranger that you're never gonna see again, but you're still going to obey the norm even with them. All right, great, we got time for one more question. Hi, my name is Anna, I'm from Florida State University, and we've talked a lot about the formation of social norms. So I was wondering what causes social norms to break down and what that process is like. Does it happen at the same rate as its formation or does it happen faster? And like, what is that whole process like? That will be your dissertation <laughs> Please report back to me in two years. Um, I, this field of understanding norms uh, does have a rich trajectory or a, a rich history, I should say, in anthropology and sociology. Uh, us political economists are a little bit slow to the game in understanding this. We bring a different perspective of rationality as a framework to understanding this. Um, so my, my first answer would be consult your local anthropologists and sociologists, but from a political economy perspective, um, it's, it's all about incentives, right? When the incentives change, we change our behavior. And if there is commandments from on high that you will do this, uh, it can dramatically affect the way uh, previous norms have operated. We might be living through this experiment right now with uh, COVID and you know, the, everybody stay home, everybody wear a mask. Uh, and if you see somebody wearing a mask, you know, wag your finger at them, or you don't need that they're not wearing a mask, wag your finger at them. Um, I'm. And, and I mean, there's been studies and anecdotal evidence that this is affecting, you know, kids, um, middle school, uh, elementary school, high school students, where, where a lot of our norms are learned and where a lot of our behavioral patterns are formed early on. And um, I don't know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's something that um, deserves, it merits some attention from not only those you know, who've uh, intimately st uh, studied norms for a while, sociologists, but political scientists uh, and political economists as well. So we had a great example of this earlier in our session, which was students running late for class, going to the Starbucks, the line's way too long to get to class <laughs> on time. So well, that's if, contagious apparently. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you knew you were going to be late to class if you waited in the line, then you could cut in line because you see one of your friends at the head of the line. But normally, right, the, the old norms were people would say, hey, you know, we're all in line here. You know, you're not the only one that wants coffee. The innovation would be to text the person at the beginning of the line <laughs> and give them your coffee order and do all that stuff where it can't be observed. So the technology has provided a way of completely That's avoid acknowledging <laughs> um, Yeah, so I'm destroying norms right now. <laughs> you wanted an example. That's how you do it. Destroying norms as we speak. 
I would say another uh, way that norms end up falling out is uh, I, I'm a fan of uh, Evan Hayek. He has a chapter in the Fatal, Fatal Conceits about population and norms. And one of Hayek's arguments is that uh, societies rise and fall to a certain extent by the uh, their ability to continue in terms of numbers, basically. So we're all numbers. There. So there's almost just like there's maybe like evolutionary adaptation within individuals in like particular instances. It's possible societies have that too. So societies that are very successful at cultivating long lives of many people um, are naturally going to uh, be able to persist over time. Whereas societies that cut life short, uh, that don't value uh, the lives of other people, uh, those societies might have a natural tendency for those norms to disappear. Uh, at least, uh, I guess we would hope so, probably. All right, any last words on that? Looks like a pretty good spot to wrap here, so. All right, well, this has been a production of the Gortney Institute here uh, at Creighton University today. I usually say Auto University in that spot there. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. A five-star rating helps other people find our podcast. Otherwise, be sure to pass it along to your friends via email or some other source of social media that you use. Other than that, be fruitful and multiply. Thanks. <laughs>